Hello, uh, my name is Marone Bixen, and I'm going to be covering seven, I think, pretty simple rules for understanding how subthreshold neuromodulation or, or subthreshold brain stimulation works. And this would be a talk really for people who are a little bit up to their necks in concepts in brain stimulation uh, and electrical stimulation. If you're interested in sort of more um, basic introductory content, I have other videos that really kind of ease into some of these issues. But I'm going to try to explain things in a way that is um, not dependent on having any real technical content here, uh, just interest. All forms of, uh, we could call electromagnetic brain stimulation, but usually just called brain stimulation, or neuromodulation uses electricity, uh, work by delivering electricity into the body, whether it's an electrode or a magnet. Uh, it has to work by generating electrical current flow through the body. And that current flow is associated with the generation of electric fields. You can think of those things as interchangeable, current flow through the body or electric fields. And the body is full of neurons, your nervous system. And so when you apply electrical stimulation and generate currents inside the body, neurons are exposed to electric field. And so that's just a general background you need to be familiar with, we're going to be talking about how electric fields or currents affect neurons, and this applies to all forms of brain stimulation. Now, we're going to be talking about subthreshold neuromodulation specifically, and it's good to introduce subthreshold neuromodulation or brain stimulation by what it's not, and it's not super threshold stimulation, which is what you know 99% of the work is about, um, uh, including, uh, you know, um, for example, basic theories about how uh, neuromodulation for pain works. So what is super threshold neuromodulation? It generally describes neuromodulation, the devices, the current being put into the body as being made out of pulses, right? The pulses might come at one hertz once per second or 100 hertz, 100 times per second. And those pulses of current are applied into the body where they result in the generation of action potentials. They make neurons fire action potential. So basically, if you apply one hertz stimulation to a part of the body, you might make that part of the body generate one hertz action potentials. And then the therapeutic outcomes are secondary to sort of this pacing. So again, it's all about driving action potentials. Where are you driving action potentials? How are you generating action potentials? The main difference with subthreshold neuromodulation is you still start with application of current to the body. It can be in pulses, but it can be in other waveforms as well. And what you're doing here is you're not necessarily driving action potentials, but just polarizing the cells, changing their tone. And that's what I'm going to be explaining. And that then leads to the secondary clinical changes. Okay. So at a high level, we need to understand that all neuromodulation, all neuromodulation that uses electrical stimulation works by polarizing cells. There's no uh, exception to that. So when we say polarizing cells, I mean a change in the neuron's membrane potential. The distinction with subthreshold neuromodulation, if you want the secret of it is, is that we don't have to generate action potentials. We can change the potential of these cells in a way that is not pacing is not driving action potentials, um, um, but uh, is nonetheless doing something. And that's what I'm going to explain in sort of these seven uh, quick points. Now, uh, let me, I'm going to start by showing you data, very little amount of data, using electrical stimulation, neuromodulation with a very long pulse. So it's kind of like on and it stays on and then it's turned off for a while. And I think it's very illustrative to think about how these long, or you can call them direct current pulses, affect things in order to get a general understanding of subthreshold neuromodulation. So here we have a bunch of cells. We are exposing them to um, a slow DC stimulation pulse, and we measure how the membrane potential changes. Now this is in a paper um, that's below, and I'll have, I'll have links to all the papers uh, in the comments section below. The only thing you need to understand at the high level here is when the stimulation is turned on, you can see that the membrane potential of the cell changes. And when we turn it off, the membrane potential of these cells go back. In this case, this is being imaged with um, voltage sensitive dyes. And from this uh, paper uh, in 2004, many of the lessons about subthreshold stimulation can already be learned. The first one is you see that if you look at different parts of the cell, you're going from the top to the bottom, the type of polarization you see is different. The types of the cells, uh, the, the parts of the cell, the dendrites near the top, 
they are being hyperpolarized while the parts of the cell near the bottom are being depolarized. And this is the same stimulation, but this, the, the cell structure is being polarized differently depending on where the compartments are. So it's true to say everything is polarized, but the direction actually depends on which part of the cell we're talking about. Okay, that's lesson number one, that's it. Lesson number two, the polarization tends to look like the stimulation. So here the stimulation was turned on for a while, and the cell polarized for that same amount of time. If we left the stimulation on for 10 minutes, it would have been polarized for 10 minutes. If we oscillate the, the stimulation up and down, the cell membrane will also oscillate. So there's this sort of, uh, at a first approximation, relatively sim simple tracking between the polarization and the waveform that we put in. So that's why waveform matters. Now it's not an exact perfect tracking. You can see that there's this bit of charge time when you first turn the, the field on, but that's why waveform matters. It's why direct current on is not the same as stimulation with a wiggle or with a fast wiggle. Now, if I were to flip the direction of a stimulation, what that means in the case of direct current stimulation is just flipping the polarity, the terminals on the battery, the direction of polarization flips as well. And again, that data is in the paper um, and it is an important point uh, to keep in mind, but it doesn't change the fact that the entire cell is being polarized and one end is being polarized one way and one end is being polarized um, the other way. Um, and finally, uh, a big point, uh, maybe sort of an, um, an obvious one in the context of what I've been saying, the stimulation doesn't generate action potentials. When the field is turned on, you don't see a bang, 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 a bunch of action potentials. What you see is a change in polarization, a small change as it turns out. It's only about a millivolt in this particular experiment. And because of that, it's not enough to generate action potentials. So this is the basic idea that subthreshold stimulation, we're not looking for direct action potential generation. And so this leads to the big question in subthreshold neuromodulation. How does stimulation, right, that is not intense enough to trigger action potentials, though still producing some polarization, how does that modulate brain function, right? Brain function is all about action potentials. And so if we're applying a polarization, but that polarization is not generating action potentials, it's just kind of polarizing, how do we change function? And so the answer to that is not by generating de novo action potentials by pacing, but rather changing ongoing activity, all right? Changing how the brain you see is, is, is always active. It's never inert. And so when we're applying stimulation to the brain, what we're actually doing in the case of subthreshold theories is changing what is already happening in the brain. And one particular place to look where how things are changing is when we talk about synaptic efficacy. All right, synaptic efficacy is a measure of the connectivity between one, you know, multiple neurons at a synapse. Um, and you know, I, I have a, 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 a whole talks about that. Here, I just want to leave it at that very high level that all the neurons in your brain are connected via synapses. Those synapses can be weaker, those synapses can be stronger. And as I mentioned, the brain is already active. And that means that the synapses are already active. They're all, all the neurons are firing, they're all communicating with one another. And so all these synapses are always popping um, on and off inside your head. And it's in, in this active sort of soup of, of activity that we are applying subthreshold stimulation. So now we can ask the question more specifically, how does stimulation, subthreshold stimulation that produces this polarization of the neuron, how does that change synaptic activity or synaptic processing. So now I'm going to summarize uh, uh, you know, almost two decades of research in a minute. These are all the papers. I've linked to them below. And, and, and um, please, you, know, you, you can get into them in detail. But they all tell a very similar story. In these experiments, we always start us with a situation where before we apply uh, the subthreshold modulation, there is a background level of synaptic activity, right? The brain is active um, for different reasons. Uh, and we can measure the strength of the activity and specifically the strength of connectivity between two populations of neurons using different techniques. We call them um, excitatory postsynaptic potentials or field excited postsynaptic potentials. And what you just need to understand here is that the size of these blips measure the connectivity between two parts of the brain, how strong the connection is, the, the, the synaptic link between two parts of the brain. And you can see that after a short period of time here, it's rather stable. Now we apply the sub-threshold modulation. In this case, again, I'm showing you data with 
long DC pulse that's on for the time that here's in red. And you can see by eye that the strength of connectivity between these two populations of neurons, the synaptic efficacy, increases as long as the field is on. And when we turn it off, it goes away. This is the essential result. There's a lot more to unpack about this. But what we, we and others have clearly shown is that when the brain is active, neurons are talking to one another via synapses. And when you apply sub-threshold sub fields, you change how those synapses work. Now, the reason we have, to, we have to spend so much time unpacking it is I already mentioned this compartment-specific polarization. And what that means is that you can polarize a dendrite here, you can polarize a dendrite there, you can polarize a soma, and you can also polarize the synapses themselves, the axon terminals. In fact, they're all being polarized at the same time. And the change you see in synaptic activity is an aggregate of all this different polarization. So that's why there's all those papers below and many more that needed to unpack the nuanced ways in which uh, we could establish that sub-threshold neuromodulation changes synaptic processing and also how much it is. It ends up being about a 1% change uh, in synaptic efficacy per this electric field unit of, of volts per meter that also led to change in plasticity. And I have a, a whole talk about thinking about how neuromodulation changes synaptic plasticity um, and what it means. Okay, so brain function does depend on action potentials, right? And the subthreshold neuromodulation is not generating uh, action potentials, it's modulating ongoing action potentials, right? Uh, and so it's not pacing the way super threshold modulation is, but rather changing it. Let's think about that a little more. Okay, so this is already written rule number six, right? There's only one left after this. And this is an idea that was developed in this paper. Let's go through it simply. Imagine here a cell uh, and it has a membrane potential. It starts at what's called a resting membrane potential that's often around minus 70 millivolts, right? This is the cell hanging around, not doing much. It may happen that that cell becomes excited for some reason some synaptic activity arrives at that cell. You're thinking about something and that drives synaptic input onto the cell. It's depolarizing up and up. And if it gets to a particular uh, me membrane potential called an action potential threshold, it would generate an action potential, right? So this is without sub-threshold nothing. This is just generally how the cell is working, all right? Now imagine if the cell was sitting around and an input came, but it was a little bit weaker, right? That synaptic input came in, and it was enough to polarize it up instead of 20 millivolts, 19 millivolts, but not quite enough to get to an action potential threshold. So it doesn't generate an action potential. These action potentials are all or none. You either get the threshold or you, not, you don't. Now, imagine we add on top of this some subthreshold neuromodulation, some weak DC pulse, not a lot, but just enough to polarize the cell up one millivolt. Well, what's gonna happen? Well, now we're gonna to get to the action potential, right? Because now we have the combined effect, right, of the excitatory input, which is not quite enough to produce an action potential of 19 millivolts, plus the one millivolt contribution of the subthreshold polarization. So now you can see how in this particular um, idea, a little jump up can make all the difference. And I'm showing you here this in cartoon form, but all this was demonstrated in actual cells in, in the paper that's, that's indicated below, okay? So that's this idea where when you um, apply a small stimulus, right, you're gonna bump up that potential, and now something that previously wasn't sufficient to get you to an action potential does, right? A small polarization can make all the difference. That's a really big idea, idea number six. Now it turns out there's another twist to this, Let's imagine now that the cell was, the input was strong enough to produce an action potential, right? So now you're getting to that on its own, no, no subthreshold neuromodulation. Now we do add some more subthreshold neuromodulation. What's gonna happen? Well, based on this cartoon, if you're tracking what happens, right? Here comes the subthreshold neuromodulation. We jump it up. The synaptic input comes in. The cell's gonna fire anyways, but you notice that it fired earlier than it would have otherwise, right? The presence of, right? The subthreshold field made the synaptic input, uh, uh, made, made the cell fire earlier. It turns out that in the nervous system, it doesn't, it doesn't just matter if you generate an action potential or not. 
The timing of it matters a lot. So in this paper, we showed that subthreshold neuromodulation couldn't just have a big effect on whether or not you fire an action potential, but also on the timing of it. And it also turned out that the, uh, a very simple ex equation explained how much change in timing you would get. Again, I refer you to the paper for all the details, but basically what it says is the amount of acceleration in this case in timing you'll get, right? The change in timing, right? is going to equal to how much polarization is produced by the subthreshold field divided by the ramp slope of the incoming synaptic input. Uh, and that is actually an equation that shows a um, amplification effect based on how gradual the input is. That's it, one more example of how subthreshold neuromodulation works. Here we need to, again, go back to this notion of the brain as active and realize that the, it's not individual cells that are sort of doing stuff on their own, but aggregates of cells that are communicating together and often generate an activity that sort of re represents a coherent coupling between them. And this can be manifest in what's called oscillations, these sort of rhythmic cycles of activity that are uh, evident not just in one cell, but in a large collection of cells. And again, I'm going through things here very rapidly. Everything is in the papers. Um, that is linked below. So now you need to imagine that, let's say you have an uncoupled population of neurons, everyone's kind of doing uh, their own thing. Uh, and now we have a situation where we generate a more oscillatory coherent activity, where now it's not just that the neurons are active, but they're active in a very organized way. They're actually cycling, right? That's where we get the oscillation uh, through waves of activity. And it turns out that your brain is constantly doing this. Your brain is full of cycles, full of oscillations. They're called alpha, and when you're sleeping, they're called slow wave. But it's not just that your brain is active, it's that your brain is active in these, sort of, in these tightly coupled active networks. So what do you have? You have neurons constantly moving in and out of threshold, and they're talking to one another via synapses. And if you followed everything I've said so far, you'll realize that this is sort of a perfect storm for sensitivity to subthreshold neuromodulation. And that's exactly what we and others have found that when you have an oscillating network of cells, they are very sensitive to influence uh, by subthreshold electric fields. This is just one example. This is um, data uh, showing an oscillation. Uh, the, the network is oscillating. This represents many cells operating together, and it has sort of a stable power. And then a long DC pulse is applied, and you see a very, uh, uh, dramatic response to that DC pulse, and also a sustained boost of the oscillations. When the stimulation is turned off, you see a dramatic response to it being turned off, and a gradual recovery to the level of oscillations before. This is one, one example of many showing that oscillating, active, coupled systems are very sensitive to subthreshold neuromodulation. Um, and um, what's more is we can, we can really characterize this in a lot of detail using animal models. We can generate detailed computational models that predict these kind of responses. And I think it's a great substrate to start to understand also how subthreshold neuromodulation works. So I covered a lot here and I jumped through it. The references are available for you to get into in more detail. Uh, for those of you interested in the sort of more general background introduction to uh, neuromodulation and some of these terms I've been using. Uh, I do have a video on that. Um, I also have a video that really gets into the translational aspects of this, like, okay, so we can change synaptic plasticity, uh, we can change synaptic efficacy, how do we use that to develop treatments and so on? Uh, so you're welcome to check that out again. Um, thank you for your uh, attention.